Hi everyone, this is Dr. Cleopatra. Welcome back for another episode of the Parents Coffee Talk. And Dr. Rowe is here and we have Hello. a very special guest today. My dear, sweet, amazing, gorgeous friend, Melissa Mayo. And Melissa is here to talk to us about all of the things that she's known for her amazing cooking, her amazing abs, which she loves to say are made in the kitchen, not in the gym. But what I think is even more spectacular about her is the way that she manifests miracles and how she has created everything in her life out of nothing. So I'm so excited to have you here with us today, Melissa. And Dr. Rowe, could you do a formal bio for Melissa before I we dive be into all those juicy topics that I can't wait to yeah. cover? Okay. Um, so I'd be honored to do that. So Melissa is an author. She's an imp inspirational speaker and a strategy mentor dedicated to helping others bring their dreams to life. She's also a food network chef. And during the summer, she teaches transform transformational wellness retreats at her home in Luca, Italy. Um, and she uses, uh, she uses the tools that she's outlined in her sixth book. I know she's working on another book right now, but the, out of all the things she does, um, she's a wife and a mama. And I know being a mama is something you're really serious about. So thank you for taking the time. You're such a like-minded sister in many ways. Um, and welcome to the Parent Coffee Talk, where we just kind of talk about different things while we have some tea or coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I mean, I'm listening to both of you speak about me. I'm like, I don't, it sounds so cool, but kind of <laughs> a little bit awkward. You, you built me up to this platform. I'm like, am I really that cool? You, you are, are that you cool. Are. Wait, I That's know. Good, right? <laughs> I have known this woman for 10 years. I know for a fact she is that cool. But yeah. you know, I think that it's just an, such an illustration of your humility and how firmly planted your feet are on the ground, which people could really miss just by seeing you and seeing what you're doing out in the world. And I love that so much about you. Well, I will say that really the truth of the matter is I've built my audience and my amazing community by being real and authentic. Um, I, I always say everyone else is taken, so I can just be me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love it too. Uh, share the good parts because we've all got, you know, parts of our, our, our rise where we've been broken and battered and, and mm -hmm. torn. And the trick is to get back up and learn and move forward. And it's those growth points that make us stronger and who we are and warriors. So, um, yeah, you know, I'm always learning. I love to surround myself with like-minded people and read a lot. And if I haven't learned something new every single day, I'm always in a state of learning, then I, the day's been a waste. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, always just trying to move forward, baby steps, one by one. <laughs> I love Evolving, right? Evolving and learning. And you're yeah. such a worldly person. So yes. you are from, I, you know, I know, I hear your accent, you, you're living in LA, you summer in Italy, where, tell us about your, a little bit about you. So actually I was raised in South Africa, um, Johannesburg, South Africa, and I lived there until I was 24. Uh, but from a very young age, I loved the stage, I loved the, the, the pull of the entertainment industry. So as soon as I finished my MBA, I packed up. I came to this country with like $2,000 and a dream. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I literally have been pursuing it every single day. And um, I'm blessed to say every day, uh, it kind of, I wake up excited to get to my life, which wasn't always the case. Um, there was a time in my life I hated what I did. I hated being in an office and working as an accountant. And I finally realized that if I didn't shift, I was going to end up like my late parents dying at their desk with all their dreams still inside them. Mm. So I took a gamble and I followed um, my heart and my passion. Everyone else said, you're going to starve. But um, I went on to reinvent myself. And I am a food network chef, but I'm not classically trained in that sense that I'm the person who uh, does souffles. I'm more of a, a cook's cook. 
Mm -hmm. I'm your mama or your grandma in the kitchen who's going to use real ingredients and real recipes that are simple, uh, terms that everyone can apply. Um, and then I always teach my students to add that secret ingredient that only they can bring to the dish, which is them, their mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's so important. Uh, cooking for me is a way to show people I love them. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we come together around food and, 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 and that is where race, religion, culture, economic brackets, everything falls away around the dinner table. And the kitchen is just my happy place. And so I've just been blessed to really just wake up every day and do the things I love. But I am an exact example of someone who decided they were going to shift their life, move away from, you know, something that was paying the bills to something that pulled towards their heart and their passion. And I've been able to turn it into an amazing, successful business. And as I say, I get to teach under the Tuscan sun in my Italian kitchen. So I'm living proof that if you get up, if you have focus and you know where you're going and you're willing to put in the work and stay the course and keep, keep, keep plugging away at your dream, you can make it happen in your, in your everyday life. Mm, so good. So good. I love that so much. Okay. So, so many things I want to hear more about. So your, your new, your new house in Italy and the new version of the school that you've been creating, dr dreaming up and creating and life in Italy and going back and forth from Los Angeles to, to Luca and really just this pathway of creating miracles and believing in miracles so clearly and deeply that they can't help but come true for you. Because I think that that's what's so amazing about you, Melissa. So first and foremost, let me just say that life in Italy is actually very much like life under Corona quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> I know for, for, for people it's like, oh my God, I'm cooking and I'm in the kitchen and I can only really walk and spend time with my family and everything else has fallen away and I'm not in traffic and there's not this go, go, go pace where I've got to do something, but I actually have time to, so kind of the world is getting a slight taste of what it is to live uh, La Dolce Vita in mm. Italy style, you know, long lunches that come together around real things like people food conversation so it's I, not love that. I said to my husband I'm like I feel like I'm in Luca the only difference is instead of walking around the wall or along the river I now can walk around century city but mm -hmm. still <laughs> um, but yeah you know when I when I first put my first website up uh, the chef website um I sent it to my mom and it had born in South Africa, living in LA, retiring in Italy. And her exact words were like, you need to take that down. You don't have a house. You don't have the money. People are going to laugh at you. I don't want them laughing at you. Take it down. And I had a website for, I don't know, maybe eight years, 10 years before the house manifested. But it was that kind of bold. I don't care if you laugh at my dreams. They're my dreams and I'm going to own them. And the truth is right. Oh, I have such goosebumps right I'm now. I'm the one who's laughing because if you had gone to my website all those years ago, you probably would have bumped into my mom and said, so does Melissa have a house? And she would have told you no. And then called me and said, take it down, take it down, which she did repeatedly. But then the day finally came that enough positive energy towards the finish line, towards what I had envisioned, um, made it part of my reality. And it was the, the specific details that I put into the picture that really brought it to life because mm -hmm. I, I believe we are powerful, powerful co-creators with, mm -hmm. you know, with our source. We can bring uh, energy into matter. But, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be specific about what you're trying to create. So Amen. I knew what the city looked like. I, I, I mean, where that city was. I knew what the house looked like. I pictured myself as a nonna. I was really specific in the picture and what I was flashing out into my imagination. And I will tell you something. When it came to be, it was exactly like what I pictured. Yes. I was like, damn, 
I should have yes. thrown more bells and whistles into the dream. <laughs> that, that is awesome. I should have thrown more bells. I love that. So we we do a family visioning process, a family vision board every year, and I teach it to my mamas to envision their babies and the family that they want when they're preparing for pregnancy. And for some of them, it's so hard in the beginning because like, you know, some of them have been trying for 16 years to get pregnant. And so for them the shift to finally being able to envision and really see and feel and and exactly it's not just envisioning it's a feeling how yeah. you would feel if that dream manifested like i would go through life feeling like i owned this house and i was teaching retreats and i would picture it and i would daydream often and i would give it energy but not just the picture the feeling of how it yes. would feel to have already realized it yes. it's a mind shift it's a Woo! no yeah. longer a mental picture it's a feeling because the truth is our subconscious you know i w watched my daughter she's a teenager learned to drive recently and you know i could see in her mind you know turn on the car put it into drive you know put the foot on the gas. I could see so many things in her mind working to piece together how to drive. And we kind of drive on cruise control because it's already wired into our subconscious. Mm -hmm. But when you want to put anything new in your subconscious, it's small little right. pieces and step by steps. So what really right. happens is those little pictures and those little details and those feelings are what goes to program the subconscious so it becomes second nature. And you can wire your subconscious with your thoughts and your emotions mm -hmm. it's like when you jump into a swimming pool you know how to float but you could never explain to somebody what it is to swim they would need to feel what it is to swim and float ah so good yeah. i love that so much it's like we we um uh you often hear the saying that everything is created twice first in your mind and then in in your real life in the tangible world right we have to we have to see it and i love how you said i wish i would have added more bells and whistles because you i literally got everything that i kept seeing over and over again good. you know yeah. here, just to give you a crazy thing and like a crazy idea we were house shopping for a while you know i i kind of would go to italy and go house shopping and the funny thing about italian homes is that because um the downstairs used to be the stables they have tiny little windows with little like only s small windows that let in very little light mm -hmm. and the tuscan architecture won't allow you to change the landscape of it because they want to keep authentic to what italy looks like mm -hmm. so all the homes we saw were so dark but in my dream home <laughs> i'm drawn to light i'm drawn to light spaces it had these like giant picture windows you see on these like malibu beach homes with big windows yes unheard of but the house that popped into our Google search, what? floor had been added by an American architect. It's unheard of. Italians come into my house and they're like, why do you have so many windows? My whole top floor is like one giant window. But oh. it's because it was specific. I didn't want a dark little farmhouse. I didn't care the size of it, but it needed to have light. Mm -hmm. And that was painted into my picture. And there it was. It came with all its light and windows. So yeah, the universe that gets the memo. Incredible. You know, it's I'm like getting in a car. You know, you don't get in a car and just drive off to some destination. You have to put something into your GPS. So it's like that. You have to tell your manifestation what you, where you're going. You have to pick that dream and you have to focus on it. You can't just be like, oh, I wouldn't mind one day, you know, traveling the world. You have to list the towns and what you want to see and when timelines you need to be specific <laughs> yes there's, there's so many things that i love about this conversation melissa and i think there's a, some important parts that i want to kind of um unpack and dig dig deep in and that's that you know when we have these dreams there are going to be fear-based people around us that are going to yes. tell us no and you know 70 percent of all decisions are made out of fear so it's yeah. 70 percent so you're gonna have a lot of scarcity mindset people around you and i love that you held the vision and you were like no this is what's gonna happen and um before we got out, got on and we started taping 
you know, Melissa and I were talking about, you know, we're, we're women like in our forties, I'm guessing. And, you know, I've had a lot of shifts in my life. I've always right out of the gate was a strong kid, strong woman, uh, wasn't always popular as a kid because I just had a real strength, strong strength of, of, um, justice and sense for myself and a knowing, right. Cause I had higher power giving me insight and I love to link up and I link up all the time. So, um, so for us that have this strength of character and we're like, this is just what it is. But what I love about women in their forties and fifties, they start to own their power. And this yeah. is something, and you're giving people the tools to get there. And really what it's about is, you know, having that vision, putting intention around it, daydreaming, being really purposeful. All three of mm -hmm. us do that. I do that all the time with all kinds yeah. of projects when I yeah. have my kids, you know, and then, you know, for women that have had bad relationships, unable to get pregnant, failed businesses, whatever, there's a history of worry that's valid, right? But it doesn't mean that you can't hold the vision and those parts to it are, you know, don't have a discussion with naysayers about it. Hold firm, but also really intensely visualize it and take steps towards it, right? So your yes. steps were to look for houses, you know, um, to, to create an account for it, to do all those things. And there's just like, we're in America, which I love, right? Because, you know, I'm, you're an immigrant. I'm a daughter of an immigrant. And actually, Cleopatra's a daughter of an immigrant. Yeah. And and so our culture, what we know is like, this is the land of opportunity. And yeah. you can do anything. My parents taught me you can do anything. So I didn't yeah. have limiters. I had limitless people pushing me. Which I love so which much. Which is amazing, I, right? I, I actually had a totally opposite um way in which uh, I, I was brought up that made me the dreamer I was. I grew up with parents that were children of, uh, you know, war survivors, war orphans, and they had a scarcity mentality. And my late parents literally died at their desk in their 70s with a mountain of regret and their dreams still inside them. They were not happy. They were miserable. But watching them just exist and be, you know, made me want to get to the end of my life having lived to the pearly white gates and say, I've done it all. I have yeah. done it all. That movie up where you see that little couple that saves pennies and something always comes up. And at the end of the time, when it's time to take that trip to Paradise Falls, there's no sand left. Oh, yes. That to be me. So mm -hmm. people always say, you know, were you raised with a silver spoon in your mouth or did you come from a lot of money? You know, you got this house because I didn't. I came from a very low to middle class family. My friends were much wealthier. They would like refer to my house as a cottage. And I came to this country with $2,000. My husband and I, we started from nothing. We made it from nothing. But as you said, I had a vision and I was not afraid of doing the work. I was yeah, not it's afraid about working. of learning, reading, doing. If, if I needed a skill, or I needed to master something to move me forward, or I needed to, to um, grow my business or, or, or or show up in a certain way. Uh, I, I learned the skills I needed. There was never an excuse. And when I did encounter those naysayers, I had like a big do not disturb sign on my imagination. <laughs> you know, okay. What? Fear, doubt, negativity, they will pop up. But like I built an underground bunker. I had like a cheese and wine party. I invited them all over and I locked the door and I ran. <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it's just, you have to, because those, those emotions are, are inside of you and they will creep up every now and then they will but it's do you allow them to to, to um take root and and, and o overwhelm you or do you just pick another thought that makes you feel empowered or better or, yeah. or do you flip the situation on its head like i have i have to tell you for every success i've had in my life i've probably had like three failures but that that has made me strong enough to ignore the naysayers and thank the doubters and be like, hell yeah, you right. made me figure out that I was strong enough to do it anyway. Well, because opportun I mean, entrepreneurs, they make mistakes, you know, yeah. scientists don't just make an invention, right? 
the scientist Dr. Yeah, Dr. The, the scientific process has lots of ups, ups and downs embedded in it. Yeah. Yeah. What did Thomas Edison say when they mocked him and how long it was taking him to make a battery? He said, I now have a hundred ways of how not to make a battery. Yes, yes. But that's all about, you know, all of this, Melissa. So, you know, you have your family of origin. We, we a, lo a lot of what we learn, how we parent, how we eat, all mm. that stuff is inherited, right? Like that we learn those behaviors and, but they don't have to define you and you have to start always within, always within and you can break out of anything. I mean, I think about, you know, for me, you know, my Ridgefield, Connecticut center, like people that have been, you know, had traumatic, you know, trauma, just horrible things happen to them and how they've risen. And it's always just such a strength within, even though they've broken down at times, Mm -hmm. um in many different ways it's like it's what you tell yourself and your past doesn't have to define you because the truth oh. is that in my last book i actually opened up about it my parents were married my entire life but they never shared a bedroom for their entire life they never shared a kiss an anniversary i grew up in a very toxic household they loved me but they did not love each other mm. and i have a very happy marriage to you do best friend who just gets me like i would rather spend time with my husband than anyone else on planet earth i know but i, I looked at it. what they yeah. did mm -hmm. and i did it differently so mm -hmm. if you come from something that is more painful or a place that was darker or uh, was not ideal there are lessons in the darkness there are lessons in the struggle and the trauma it can teach you to do it over and differently because the truth is we are all in the driver's seat when it comes to where we want our life to go. Like mm -hmm. literally you can blame everybody and you can put it on someone else and you can choose to not forgive people and walk around thinking everything is everyone else's fault. But the second you take responsibility and you realize you're in the driving seat, that is the only time that you can literally send your car to your dream destination. That's a very big thing. Taking action and also taking responsibility. If you fall, taking responsibility for the fact that you got it wrong. And mm -hmm. say to yourself, what can I learn from this? Why did this go wrong? Because I don't want to repeat this mistake next time. Mm -hmm. But you, if you're always looking at somebody else to bring you your dreams or make it happen for you or an excuse as to why, you're stuck. You're stuck mm -hmm. in a place and you're going nowhere. And if you say, you know, in that, when this happens, I will be happy. I will do that. Like, and so, you know, and for those people that ha are stuck for something at a pain point, because something has happened and it's hard, you know, it's a valid experience. You should grieve that. You should feel that emotion. You shouldn't try to push it down, but you move through those stages and you start one place just one place one action you didn't this didn't happen overnight for you i love that you're like it took you eight years to get this house exactly and i will tell you that i uh, i feel to myself that when i'm creating something whether it's i'm writing or i'm creating a dish or i'm building or i'm writing a post or i'm engaging with i i feel like i'm in a co communication with my source and my creator but there was a time okay. shortly after my mom passed away that my happy place my kitchen was like literally the stuff of my worst nightmares. Every time I fired up the burners, I could feel her. I was so overcome with grief. I was in mourning and I stopped cooking. It was okay. I stopped cooking for a year. I found other things to do. I volunteered at church. I did other stuff, but mm -hmm. I found other actions and other outlets for creativity, but it's okay to, to acknowledge the pain and let it sit mm. and go through it, not around it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was like, yes. I'm happy in the kitchen. Okay, so find something that doesn't feel so sore. Find something that doesn't feel so raw inside. I started working with, with charities, with people that were less fortunate than me and seeing them and what they were struggling with and helping them heal helped me heal. Mm -hmm. But I didn't just sit in the pain. Mm -hmm. You can feel it, but... You have to move it into a places that start helping you heal. Mm -hmm. And there and there's ways to do that, right? You chose to connect through people that, that were less fortunate. You can get therapy, you can mm -hmm. do movement, there's you can do prayer. I mean, there's just a multitude of ways. That's where I, 
I took control. I was in the driving seat. I was, so my choice was, which it was for a few months, was to drink too much wine until I found that mm-hmm. that was not where I was going to find my answers and I had to make different choices. <laughs> yeah. But I was in the driver's seat. No one was going to help me move past, past my grief. No one was going to help me heal. I was going to have to do the work to move through and past it. And there what? wasn't a magic pill. It no. was work. And, no. you know, um, and you, you know, okay, so drinking wasn't the healthiest choice, but you, you recognized it. And, yeah, you know, for a while after that, I didn't actually drink. I was like, you know what? It's not so good to drink alone. This is what I'm doing to numb it. And the next day I wake up and I feel crappy. And then I, until I realized, you know what? It's a social thing. I love to drink with friends and cooking. And so for a while, I just stopped and gave myself the chance to feel the pain. It's okay. Pain mm-hmm. gives you something. It's okay. Pain is, pain, pain makes you feel real and alive. And, and it's and a, it's a, an important source of information, right? It's like something needs your attention here. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But you know, when you fill it with, whether it's shopping or gambling or drugs or sex or booze, you're just numbing out the messages your body's sending you saying something's off right now. Mm-hmm. You need to fix it. You need to fix the root. And so my pain point was cooking. And then when I like opened my eyes, I was like, okay, so we're going to eat out for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I want to cook. It's just yeah. too- what brought that? you back to cooking after your grief yeah, and question. your rebirth? What brought you back? Help me heal. I actually, this was a year ago, I actually had lunch with Cleopatra before I went to write my sixth book. And I was supposed to write a, a meals movement, uh, like motivation book about how to build abs in the kitchen. It was going to be recipe and wellness focused. And I said to her, there's a book inside me that I just want to write. I like, I need to write this for me. I'm not writing this for my audience. It's what I need to write. And actually I went off the grid for 12 days. I put 65,000 words on the page. And by the time I had them on the page, they included all of my darkest moments. They included all the things I'd been hiding from. They helped me see the trajectory of my life and where I'd gone wrong and where I'd learned. And by putting it down on the page, the stories no longer had any power over me. Mm, the process wow. of writing was so cathartic that I came away light. There was nothing holding me down because just like I, I told you, you know, there was a point where I was drinking. I put that on the page. I yeah. put down all the you things. Thought you were shining light on it. Yeah hiding in the recesses of me and by actually so I would say to people you know journaling or writing because the second it hits the page it no longer has power and control over you it's now words on the page that belong to your book or your journal or your you know and and that helped me heal actually writing through my pain I saw you when you came home. She she showed she pulled out the sixty five thousand words to show me, and I was like, it just poured out of her. And In then there was, yes, yeah, amazing. It was so amazing. And then and and it was there was so much energy that came into you as you got those words Do out. You remember? I remember you that you know. My parents come to me, my late parents, as butterflies. And on the last day of writing my book, mm. I was thinking about how I was going to talk about how the monarch butterflies that migrated through California last February were there when I was making this decision. And because they were butterflies, I was like, okay, I'm going to go with this book. On the last day of writing, I was walking along the river and a butterfly landed on me and stayed on me for an hour. My energy was so clear and so pure by that point all the pain was on the page that this butterfly just wanted to hang out with me it could oh, sense so magical. the energy i was at it was crazy it was that's incredible well that's not yeah. crazy that's your those are your parents you know it was, yeah, it was so love. magical it was yeah. so magical i thought so video of it now you know um just to switch gears for a minute but not that far off you know, I know you, you know, are part of Food Network and you've been on there. I don't know your story. So tell us how that journey happened. So that journey happened because um, 
I was literally working as a, you know, as a, a forensic auditor and uh, that's, was, that does not sound exciting, like you know, at all. You doing that. <laughs> I was earning a ton of money. I was working 90 hour weeks. I, I was literally gray uh, and hated my job. I wanted to like jab needles in my eyeballs. And then I met my husband and my daughter is a honeymoon baby. So when I had her, we didn't have any family in LA. And so I decided that I was going to take time off those years to be with her. And uh, I don't do a greater second of it, but when it came time to go back to work and she was in preschool, the thought of going back to a cubicle and fluorescent flickering lights, it was like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> and a friend of mine actually worked for Hans Zimmer, um, the Oscar winning composer, and he ran a recording studio in Santa Monica where they had 30 composers that were working on TV scores and movies. And he said to me, come cook for us come cook for us every day. So for about two years, I got to literally drop my daughter at preschool and then I would go and make lunch for these composers and I would just experiment with what I had on hand and I would get like a real-time feedback, what they liked, what they didn't like. And it was an amazing training ground. And then I ended up opening a cooking school in my kitchen and then Food Network reached out to me and said, would you like to be on the show, Private Chef for Beverly Hills? And so I... My dream is always to be on TV. I'm like, yes! <laughs> so I said, hell yeah! And I, I did it. And it, it was a great, great experience. It was a fabulous... It was, it was another dream of mine that had come true. I'd always seen myself on TV. And then my mom used to say, well, an acting is not a real job. It doesn't pay the bills. But I managed to, you know, manifest it and bring it into my reality. And so... That was it. And then I realized from Food Network, I could reach people all over the world because people were calling me and saying, oh, I saw your show and we loved it. People were calling me from all over. And I was like, obviously an addict. I just wanted more of this, more, more, more. And so I launched my website and started sharing recipes and videos and blogging about food and just sharing it with my community. And I was fortunate enough just to grow it and write many cookbooks and wake up every day. Just, I literally can write about anything I want to. I've got no big team telling me you have to do this or that. So anything that speaks to me that day is what I share or put on the page. And yeah, so now I get to have my audience come and spend, you know, week long retreats in Tuscany. And the best part is, you know, being a foodie and having spent so much time going backwards and forwards between Italy, I now know all the places to go that are not the tourist traps. Like I know the sixth town in the Cinque Terre that no one will tell you about, which is where the locals go because the others are too, too touristy. <laughs> or I know the place that's not on Yelp and TripAdvisor, that's in the back streets of like uh, Firenze, that's the best gelato or the best Nonna's kitchen. So I decided that what I really wanted to do was take this love of Italy and passion and, the, you know, for food and, and la dolce vita and transform it into a very small, like intimate backstage part, like red carpet look into Italy. By taking all my years of experience with food and chefs and, and places to go, vineyards, and putting it into this all-inclusive retreat where literally all you have to do is book your air ticket and arrive. There is no hidden cost. There's no, you know, extras you just arrive and get this amazing experience obviously with cooking as well uh, just a place that everyone who's had Italy on their bucket list can come know so whether they're crazy. coming alone or they're coming with you know their mother or their girlfriends they're going to have an amazing trip and they're going to leave having formed a family after that trip I was, so that seemed like I a what this is because like is this a small group of six people, eight people? They stay in your in your home. Like, what is this like? I so, want to hear about a paper. I have a magnificent extra property that's not attached to my home called Susina Cucina. It's named after uh, a, the plum tree that my late mother actually asked me to plant before she passed. So I have this gorgeous property that's got a magnificent pool and a, a cooking school that has space for 10 people to do demo style cooking classes mm -hmm. and just uh, a few miles down the street is a magnificent private uh, villa that's very Italian Renaissance style that I take over 
for the week and everyone has private rooms on suite so literally they arrive think you arrive and the van comes to pick you up from florence or pisa a private van and you get to go to your, your, your the villa and unwind to like a welcome basket and then from the time you arrive you're picked up in the morning brought to the school there's yoga there's classes there's day trips to vineyards there's either a trip to the cinques or and the towns and the boat ride or if you want to do Florence, there's Florence, there's a Michelin restaurant. It's, it, everything's included. It's just so it's, it's, magical. It's <laughs> and it's only 10 people. So it's really intimate and, 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 and exclusive. And it, it's, I've taken all the guesswork out of it. I didn't want people to like, oh, well, the food's included, but only your first drink. You want to have a whole bowl of wine? That's fine. You don't have to put out. Well, the you know, that's what the real Italians, Italians do. You know what I'm saying, Melissa? Yeah. So you know we don't put limits on what you can. Have. <laughs> I love it. We'll be like, you know, you'll go on these trips and then you'll the food will be included, but then you end up with like a big alcohol bill or shopping or the transport to and from the airport wasn't included or the boat trip wasn't included or the tour around the Florence food market or the walking food tour wasn't. Or so I decided the only add-on that I wanted was I have this great spot where I literally you get Gucci Prada like Armani for like don't even ask how the price has got to be those prices but they are <laughs> that would be the only time of the whole trip that it was if you wanted to buy something Italian to go home with that would be the only time you would need to have your wallet but the rest of it I wanted it to be all inclusive yeah. I wanted the mm, only okay. thing you needed to do was arrive with a passport and an air ticket and everything to be done in the way that you would see Italy through a local's eyes. Mm. Not these big tour buses walk coming into a city with 50, 60 people and the person with the flag like, follow me, follow me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not you're not Googling the restaurants and, you know, like, oh, you know, yeah. locations around for the food. So, yeah, like, like, a lot of research and there's a, a strict itinerary and it's it, there's a balance between walking and yoga and indulgence that truthfully people are going to come away like feeling better and more in shape because they're going to be unplugged from their to-do lists and they're going to have you know walked a lot and eaten a lot but they're going to come back you probably will like end up losing a few pounds i mean that's the truth about when you really enjoy la dolce vita it's a, it's a sense of, of of joy that overtakes you from your head to your toes mm, i didn't want people to rush around i wanted them you really can't experience italy until you experience three hour lunches so <laughs> no rushing so yeah yeah so that is uh that's summers for me and that that's been a lifelong dream it combines my love of traveling and Italy and its culture and its people with my love of food and wellness so yeah that's been a dream oh so be that sounds so magical can we organize a trip oh my gosh I'm <laughs> coming <Absolutely. laughs> yeah I well, love you know, I love as, seeing as how this we, oh, sorry Dr. Cleopatra I was just saying I you know I I met you 10 years ago I hadn't yet met my husband. Uh, I met him very soon after I met you. But w having watched your dreams taking shape, it's just been so beautiful, Melissa. Oh, I feel the same way about you. I swear, every time I'm in your energy, I just go, it like charges me to the max. You're like the like this this light bulb, in a rainbow, or like, you know, shooting star when you, around you whole <laughs> energy is just elevated and watching you evolve and change so many lives and shift so many people and bring them their dreams i mean we've discussed it you were an identical twin i was uh, my twin was stillborn and my mom had eight miscarriages before she had me but you are bringing people their lifelong dream of having a baby and you're making it happen your success rates are off the charts it's insane like insane you're making such a difference and watching that is just such a privilege knowing mm -hmm. that you're bringing so much joy to these people it's it's, it's mind-blowing Thank you so much. And I think that that's such a powerful part of your story. Thank you so much for sharing that, you know, um, having that start to life is really impactful. And yet you got to enter 
your marriage in this beautiful way. You got to enter your fertility in this beautiful way. And you have manifested miracles in every part of your life, not just in the work that you My, my twin is like my second, like my guardian angel. I think I got a second soul. Yes. <laughs> so beautiful. Well, I have to shine for both of us. This has just been such a, like a delightful, glorious talk of, you know, just miracles and in women's empowerment and belief in their selves. And, um, we're going to share the best way to contact you in our show notes. Yes. We want to know what's the link people need in order to come to Italy with you. And yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And we are inviting you back anytime you like. I would love that so much. And Dr. Rosanna also would love to learn more about you. I mean, we connected for a few brief minutes before this call, but you know, sometimes you get that love at first sight, where <laughs> you know that you're going to be lifelong friends. The energy is just there. I'm very sensitive to energy and light. I'm one of those people as you, you know, yeah. shy away from dark places and stuff like that. I love light, uplifting, positive energy. And you're just such a source of strength and, 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 I can't wait to connect. I think we have to take this off the screen and get like a real in-person. Absolutely. And I really have enjoyed it. And I can see why that, you know, I love Dr. Cleopatra. I know you do too. And um, we should all go to Italy because, you know, you and I both have houses in Italy. Ah, uh, so. bravissima, Bella. Right? Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Friends, I'm ready. Regions. You know, the <laughs> Italians are funny. All of Italy is beautiful. I'm just saying. I mean, you know, because you know how the Italians argue about which area is better. They're, they're they're like, what I love about them, so territorial, is you can have within one town over an mm -hmm. argument for everyone's nonna's recipe is the best recipe. And I then know. between towns, like the town's only halfway so down the street, but it's like, did you see what she put in her pesto? Why yes. did she put that in her pesto? <laughs> I, love, I love my culture. I love being it's Italian. Cool. I love, I love it passion. the most. My, my friends in Italy are not wealthy. They... they peasant people, but they will take the shirt off their back and give it to you. The door is always open. They're always offering you a hot cup of coffee. They're always wanting to sit. And I mean, I'm not, the, the, they are the absolute role model for wellness and well-being right now. My neighbors are in their 90s and I find them up on the ladder, yeah. watering their garden and cleaning their, their that's Mine. all I know, Melissa. Like, yeah. I don't know elderly people in no. any way. Yeah. They're amazing and they're warm and they don't judge you. Like, it's so funny. I live in LA and, you know, I, I have one or two nice designer things, but I never feel the need to put it all out there because it's not what interests them. What interests them is, you know, the conversation around around a cup of coffee and the and the food they're very the interested food. In yeah but it's food. simple food they don't like to do too yeah. much it's like some of the best meals i've had there have been bread and olive oil and, and a glass of wine it doesn't have to be complicated it's it's this, this way that the food at the table brings the conversation and the people together so i i can't believe that you have a house in Italy. You're going to be seeing a lot more of me. You're going to have to come visit <laughs> us. And have I it. love it. And lounge at the pool and cook with yeah. me. And we're going to have to have a, a cook-off for who makes the best uh, pizza. <laughs> I know, you know, absolutely. Well, I can't I make love. pizza, but I'll watch. You we can, can, be, you can be the judge. Be Cleopatra. Don't worry I'll be the it. student. I'll be the student. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been so fun because we Thank the three of us could talk about food all day because i love it oh um, but oh. um to, to the next time we talk again melissa because i'm looking forward to it i love you so forward to it. you know what maybe when i'm in italy in the summer we can do it from there <laughs> oh, that would be so good i love that fun. so fun thank you so much for having me on ladies well, and i know too. right now you're just bringing so much life into people's homes during coronavirus so um, please let me also know all of your information. And I look so forward to sharing this with my audience. They're going to love this. Thank <laughs> you. Love Thank you. I love you, You're Melissa. So, so good to be here with you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We'll see you back again soon.